Good. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for attending uh, our talk. And um, thank you so much for having us here. It's the first time um, that we're here uh, at Graph Day Conference. And yeah, we're really excited to be part of the community. So this afternoon, um, uh, so first of all, I'm Michael Pribadi. I'm the founder of Kraken.ai. We are a tech startup based in London. And we build knowledge graphs as a database. So today, we will talk about how to work with complex graphs using a knowledge graph, using Kraken. And so what are the challenges of like, what makes data sets complex and what are the challenges that it, that, it, that it imposes on you? And what is the solution and how would you work with it? So two years ago, I was working as an optimization scheduling expert. So I create optimization algorithms for supply chains, logistics, airports, um, for some of the biggest companies um, in the world. And um, I had a very, very simple goal, which is to get the product to the customer in time while minimizing as much amount of resource as possible. So that means I had to schedule planes, trains, trucks, deliveries based on employees and availabilities. But I also had to meet labor rules, um, holiday restrictions, um, employee preferences. I had to meet, make sure I meet um, certification of certain employees, being able to do certain tasks, um, clearances, all kinds of things. When you're talking about optimization, reducing the, the cost of operation of a company, you have to consider every single variable, quite literally. And even if you're not sure whether you should include a variable, that's when you actually should include it and find out if the algorithm tells you that you shouldn't need to include it later on in the future. So it was quite easy for me to end up with I've seen a 1,000 entity UML diagram before, which took us three months to actually build it for, these com for this company. So um, I realized, <laughs> I, I, I've learned at that point that integrating information from so many sources is really, really challenging. But it's not just the ETL. The ETL is obviously challenging. You have to do the parsing and everything. And you have to do it like quite often um, not reusable from like one company to another because they have very specific data sets and they have, like, it, it, it's not transferable from like one client to another. But the biggest challenge is basically what comes afterwards, after you integrate all of this information from like 30 to 40 databases into one huge consolidated graph in which we needed to do that in order for us to be able to perform any type of like mathematical linear graph optimization on top of the data set. So, the result is basically a really complex data set. And it actually doesn't only apply to logistics, not only to scheduling. Basically, any type of intelligence systems have like, faced this problem of complex data to varying levels, um, to varying degrees, obviously. And the, 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 like, when do they see it? Like, when do they face it? The, 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 the rule is simple. If you want to make an a system more intelligent, you got to know more. If you want to know more, you need to collect more. So that means to build AI applications, you're going to face more and more of this problem of data complexity. But what do we mean? What do I mean by saying data is complex? What makes data complex? What I mean by what makes data complex is data model. Data model makes data very complex. And when you're integrating information from so many different sources, and your client actually needs you to keep those sources of information to be like model, to, to contain the model in the same way that you took it when you deliver it back to them, that then your job gets like really hard because the problems that you see in the model that you have to build are type hierarchies and, abst and their abstractions, relationship structures which are not like like possible to be represented in the current databases that we have, varying levels of granularity of information that you try to collect. Um, and business rules that you always have to comply to that the, 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 these big enterprises have that regulate the way they operate. Um, and also the fact that the scale of the model is just really big and it always needs to be updated. And what do I mean by these things? So type hierarchies, we all know what we mean by type hierarchies that um, you know, they're, like, they're databases of pilots and drivers and con con conductors and they are sitting in different databases and sometimes with different companies that work for our clients. And, um, and they have to stay that way because the information, um, the, there's a lot of things that comes with each of these entities, the, each of these objects that, um, that needs to comply with the business rules. And all of these three things, oops, sorry, 
all of these three things can actually be, be abstracted into a worker. And then you also have a customer database and all of them can be considered as a person. So not only entity and like entity types, but relation types can also have abstractions. So there's a relationship between an employee and a, and, and a company, which is a permanent contract, or one is a temporary contract, both of them are considered as an employment contract, um, and so on. Next, relationship structures. So this is where it gets interesting. Relationships quite often are actually not directional. So if Alice is the wife of, uh, is married to Bob, then both of them are married to each other and they're not, they don't have a direction. They have a role that Alice is a wife and Bob is a husband. And sometimes relationships also um, apply to different types. So the same relation of employer applies to type of startup or university in this case. And then there are also entity relationships where there are more than two participants in this relationship and you can't really split them up. So let's say a person plays the character of, um, so in this case, like Leonardo DiCaprio, an actor, plays the character of Rome, uh, Romeo in the movie Titanic. This, is, this information is atomic, you can't split them because Leonardo is only a character in the movie Titanic and then the, the movie Titanic is only played by, the character Romeo is only played by Leonardo DiCaprio. If you decompose them, it means something different. And then there's also relations within relations. So Alice is married to Bob, but then sometime along the line you want to say that I want to add more information about this marriage. This marriage actually happened in Barbados. Now, they, that, that's, that, that's something that you can't represent in graphs, for example, because you can't make an edge from an edge, right? Now, these are just the top four things that happens quite often, and a lot of other modeling complexities that we see um, can be decomposed into these four things. So the next thing is like when you're integrating information from many sources, they obviously collect information at different levels of granularity, and you have to deal with that when, you have, when you're trying to integrate all of them. So there's a database of trucks and all of the destinations, and they all contain postcodes, and trains all contains the counties and the suburbs in which they're going to, and the planes simply contain the, the, air, the, the airport code. However, these things are actually, they have a relation between themselves, and they will make your life hard soon, we will see. Now, business rules. Business rules are contained in another database. So it's basically another database saying that employees can't work longer than 16 hours in, like, in one straight shift. If an employee it works less than two hours between one shift and another, it's considered a consecutive shift. If um, employees to be assigned for a delivery, you need to make sure that this, data, this truck can only be uh, driven by employees with these type of licenses. And there are lots of restrictions in which you need to obey to. So, we all know databases don't deal with that, so it was our responsibility to make sure that information that goes into that database and the, that goes out have to abide to these rules. And, you know, we all make a bugger too every now and then. And when you're working in scheduling systems, when you're scheduling literally airports and train line systems, you cannot make one single mistake. Um, and the fact that, you know, as you collect a lot of information, you grow the scale of the model and it becomes big. So the problem that you see basically multiplies exponentially the modeling problems that, are, that we just saw just now. And then there's, there's the, 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 the fact that your client three weeks later says like, oh, I want to add this database. After we told them like, you need to confirm to us that this business model, you're going to stick with this for the next six months. They say like, yeah, 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 we can confirm. And then three weeks later, they say like, one more database. Or like, one more column in this database. So it, 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 it's, a, it's a pain. So the fact is that real world models are filled with hierarchies and hyper relationships. But our modeling techniques these days, we are only like, we, we're, uh, the, our modeling techniques these days are based all on binary relationships. So that's, that's, that's the, the root cause of the problem with the modeling complexity. What about the query? There's a lot of problems with querying when, you, when you're working with like complex data sets, but they all kind of fall into these three problems. The permutation of query interpretation, the verbosity of the queries um, on these complex data sets, and the reusability of graph analytics, because when you're collecting a lot of information, it's highly likely that you will actually want to perform some form of distributed analytics on top of it. Um, so, permutation of query interpretation. So this was, this is an actual thing, like a very simplified version of a problem that we see like in every single 
um, database that we like that that is a result of integrating these tra tra transportation information. So there are permanent drivers, temporary drivers, contract drivers, and they can all drive trucks, buses, and vans. Can't see the bottom part. There's a van there. Um, and each of the, and, and, and the, the databases containing the destination of these trucks actually are all of different levels of granularity. The two root cause of the problem here is that we need a type abstraction at this side, and we need another type abstraction on this side, and there's a, actually a transitive relation. There's a transitive relationship of located in here where postcode is in county, county is in city, and these modeling, they, 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 they don't get, uh, they are not handled by the database. So it's our responsibility to actually translate this query, get all drivers that will be arriving in London, which is a query that we would commonly like to ask, down into the permutation of every single subtype that is actually involved in this. So, of course, most often that we, we will actually write an algorithm, we would write a function to, to, to write this, the, the, this query. But even when we do that, that's actually really bad because the, moment the model changes, the, the business model changes, your application layer needs to change and you don't even know where in your code you need to change when you have like your queries translated in your application layer. And you can just go on with having like suboptimal code after the business model changes. So when you don't have, when you don't actually write functions to, 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 to translate the queries that you actually want to write onto your database, it becomes really, really verbose. Um, for obvious reasons, because the, the permutation of this is really high, but probably this is not something you want to write yourself. Um, next is reusable reusability of graph analytics. So quite often we want to run some connected components or centrality measures or clustering, uh, some other clustering algorithm, and this is an example of the clustering the connected component clustering algorithm, and it is quite generic. However. Um, so it is quite generic, and you can implement it with a lot of computer, graph computing framework available out there, like GraphX or the Graph Computer from Tinkerpop. And you would end up writing uh, Preggle Analytics or MapReduce or some form of BSP algorithm and submit it to this API, and this Vertex program will be executed um, in a distributed manner and to, to run this algorithm and get the answers back. However, that algorithm that you actually have to implement as that Vertex program is never generic because it depends on the data model that you're facing and also the subgraph in which you want to run the graph analytics on and the and you almost all the time you probably don't want to run your entire graph analytics on everything that you have because it doesn't make any sense you want to run graph analytics on some subgraph some part of the of the data set that you have and when you change and uh, that 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 subgraph you want to look at a different thing you have to change your algorithm and it's quite costly. So, so now we know we have a complex graph. So what do we do with it? Like how, how, how do we work with it? Well, where we store it kind of matters. So we thought like, you know, let's store everything in a graph because it's highly interconnected data. There's so many things and there's so many links between information. But graph databases don't have a schema. So we all know there's no such thing as data without a schema. It's either explicit in the database or it's implicit in the application layer or sometimes you don't even try to maintain it. Now, in our case, not having a model is really, really costly because no model on a complex data model, and no, no model constraint on a complex data set means exponential number of paths and exponential number of possible mistakes. And as I said, like, you, like, there are different industries that can tolerate these mistakes, but some industries really can't, especially when you have like a model this complex. So that 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 now becomes that if you go if we go with graph databases, it becomes our responsibility in the application layer to maintain this model consistency and also the query interpretation. So what about SQL? It has a schema, but it's actually not that expressive because the UML modelings that you do and the model that you define for your SQL database. Um, it, so the, the normalized data model that functions as a, uh, as, as a model constraint over the data set is actually quite low level. It doesn't have the constructs able to, for us to model the things that we said in the previous slides. So higher level abstraction still needs, uh, needs to be maintained in the application layer. And query interpretation is still our responsibility as usual. But we also know graph that like, RDBMSs are not good for querying like high number of like, relationships between data points. So 
before people ask, did we consider RDF and L? We did consider RDF and L. But RDF, the data model is still too low level, the subject predicate object the data model. It was, it was, it, it, it's, it's too low level to solve the complexity challenge that we want to solve. And of course, our is open world, database needs to do closed world semantics. I won't get into the detail of it, I'm happy to talk about it after this, like, uh, after this talk. And actually, our, our is not suitable for graph, it's suitable for tree data, actually. And if you do want to like, you know, force it to work for graphs, it's uh, quite a pain. And of course, it's really painful to learn that if you're not a logician, it's actually really hard to adopt it. So our conclusion, our different RDF and L is for semantic web, not databases, and it's for logicians, not software engineers. Yeah, but they still follow the RDF data model. It's the data model itself that doesn't allow us to model the things that we want. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll show you what the knowledge representation modeling after this, um, which we will get to. So, what is the solution? Well, we realized we needed a database in the form of a knowledge graph that uses an ontology as the data model. And then, a query language that takes advantage of this ontology, all of the type hierarchies, the relationship structures, the business rules in it, to actually perform automated reasoning to simplify the effort of actually querying your, 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 your database. And so we built Kraken. So at a high level, this is what Kraken looks like. Um, Kraken is the data storage, so that's the database. Um, we build on top of Apache Tinkerpop, which is uh, translated into Cassandra under the hood. We use Spark for the graph analytics as well as Hadoop, Kafka for the indexing, and on top of it, we build a knowledge representation system. And that whole thing becomes Kraken. And Crackle is the query language that takes advantage over the knowledge representation system to perform inference through the inference engine, as well as graph analytics. So, oh, sorry, you wanted to? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, okay, so what do we mean by ontology as a data model? Modeling tools should be able to model the real world and all of the hyper relationships and the hierarchies that it has in it. And so that, so what do we have? Why, why can we do that? Because we have a different type of knowledge representation model where you have resources, entities, roles, and relations. So, and there are rules as well, but I will explain that in the coming slides. So entities and resources. Think of it like your entity is um, uh, a table in SQL. So the, the, the object, like the person, is an entity. Um, and resource is a column in your table. So like name is a resource. Relationships, relationships well, are relationships, they connect two concepts together, um, but there are also roles. Roles describes the participation of concepts in the relationship. So employment, in this case, an example of a relationship, have two roles, employee and employer, and a person can play the role of an employee, and in this case, actually, a company plays the role of an employer, which I'm not showing here, and Come again? The company is an entity, not a resource. Yes, correct. The company will be an entity, not a resource. Um, so this is this is the knowledge, the the, the, the modeling tool, and we 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 make it. Um, we make we want people to think at a much higher level of abstraction. So you think in terms of relationships and entities, which is actually so much closer to the real world. Um, okay, what does it look like in practice? Let's actually start like 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 how do we actually model? The, 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 how do we overcome the, the modeling challenges that we had before. So this is a really, really simple ontology where I've just declared two entities, companies and person. So company, uh, per company uh, person, sub-entity, company, sub-entity. So you know the whole idea of like every object in the, in the Java world extends the object class? Well, in our world, every uh, every concept in in Kraken extends one of those four classes, and person extends entity, and company extends entity as well in this case. So we see that here they both have um, resource name, but there's only one node here that represents the name resource. That is because a resource type can be shared between different entities. 
So that makes the linking between entities even better. So a company with the name Bob and a person with the name Bob is connected through this one link, one node um, that represents the value name of Bob. And here's we start like um, adding hierarchies into the model. Um, we can see here a customer subclasses a person, which means a customer also have the resource name, but now a customer have a new special resource, which is rating. And startup subclasses company, and it has a new resource, which is funding, that you want to keep track of. It gets longer. So this is, uh, we, here, uh, here we introduce the employment relationship. And the two roles that exist in it. So employment is a related sub subclasses relation. Employee subclasses role, employer subclasses role. And employment has both of the roles, employee and employer. We've added here the person plays the role as an employee and company plays the role as an employer. This means customer can also play the role as an employee as well as startup can play the role of an employer. So um, in this graph, we can see here this is the explicit path but in practice, startups and startups play the role as an employer, and customers play the role as an employer as well. So that is the that that really, that part of the model is actually inferred. So let's look at relationship structures. How do we solve the previous relationship structure that we have? Well, relationships in the Kraken world is inherently non-directional because you have to define the relationships based on the you have to define relations with the roles that describes the participation of the entities in them. So here we see marriage is a relation, and the two roles, husband and wife. Now, what about if a relationship can actually, what, a re, you want to put an attribute to a relationship, like putting an attribute on an edge in the graph. You can also do that by simply saying, marriage has resource state. Okay, so that's like simulating what you have um, on, on normal graph databases. But what about having relationships as part of another relationship. Because re marriage here is just another concept in which we can define more uh, things in them. We can say that marriage plays the role of a located subject. And located subject is actually one of the two roles of a located in relationship. So you can describe things like Bob is married to Alice on the 14th of January in Austin, Texas, where Bob is the husband of Alice and Alice uh, is the wife. So this becomes a generic model in which you can um, model all kinds of relationships where the next one we will see it's a three-way relationship where you just add another role. So movie cast has three roles, actor, character, cast of movie. Actor is played by a person, cast of movie is played by a movie, and character is played by a fictional figure. So the example, Obviously, like Leonardo was the actor of Romeo and the character, uh, Romeo character in the film of Romeo and Juliet. Now, with these modeling tools that we have, you can model, well, like really, really, really complex things in a language which I hope we have made it to be a lot simpler for people to understand and closer to um, more a humor to a more human readable syntax. So that's all you need to know about how to define an ontology, and you can model really complex things. Yes? One of the things we've learned in public programming for a long time is that the stiffness of the inheritance model, mm -hmm. and that inheritance is generally a structure that doesn't evolve well in large scale cases. Mm -hmm. um, you've got an inheritance model that looks right here. Um, you know, you've thought about how you know So I, I didn't I didn't get what you mean by the composition so, so, model. So, um, you know, so you obviously know inheritance that you design. But, yeah. But uh, composition is about objects that hold other objects that bring in capabilities to those objects, or they implement an interface that is set of behaviors. It's not necessarily inherited. So there are some languages that actually allow the protocols to have default behaviors that get plugged into other objects. Now, I know you're not doing the language here. Mm -hmm. You're doing a, basically a schema definition. But the, the, the knowledge that we've learned from programming that inheritance is a stiff and hard to mutate and evolve data structure mm -hmm. probably is, is an, an 
for the inside chair here. I think so. Um, actually, like, I, have, I haven't thought of that before, so um, I'd love to learn more about that after, after this. Yeah, I'll come from. Yeah, I will definitely. I'm going to try to take notes. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, entities, roles, relationships, and you can do every relationship, relationship in relationship, relationship with resource, even a relationship between an entity and a resource can have a relationship in the middle. You can model really, really complex things with constructs that are close to the real world because our assumption is there's no normalization that you need to do. If you, see, if you think of a relationship, then a relationship can only be represented in one way in our world. If you think of an entity, there's one way to represent it. And yet, this is a model that you can expand really, really far. Yeah. Sorry, what's the dashed line here? Oh, that's that. That's implied. What, what does that mean? Uh, that was just for the sake of presentation. Oh. Yeah. So I mean, so if I say here that um, person subclasses, uh, person subentity plays a role as employee, and then I say custom um, customer subclasses person, that means customer can also play the role as an employee. It inherits this behavior downwards, and therefore I put a dotted line. Yeah, yeah. I'm not putting the has resource rating because it didn't fit in the screen, but there would be another note of rating if I were to draw it. Right? So, like the 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 the. the the ontologies that you have, for example, in OWL is a lot, lot more heavier. It has a lot more things, a lot more granular than this. But this is a lot more expressive than what you have in SQL. So it's you can consider it as a lightweight ontology. This, this is, yeah. Where the, 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 the syntax to define the, the, the model? Uh -huh. Well, the types will only expand when you expand your business model, right, or your domain model, if you want to track more information. This is not the data instances. This is a collection of types. Yeah. So does the types of information that you collect in the business grow? Yes. But the point is like, to make it flexible that you can always update it. So in our case, once you define an ontology and you load data into it, and then you decided, well, I want to add another resource to name. Well, you can. I want to add another relationship between person and another person. You can. Okay. Question. Yeah. So, I mean, you're not saying that you can't express these relationships with another, for example, a standard RDF, or an external RDF. Mm -hmm. There are lots of databases that are there. Yeah. So, um, I'll, I'll get, I'll, I'm, I'll, I will get to that in, in, the, in the slide. Yeah. So there, there is a difference between like the schema that they have with with uh, uh, RDF. Actually, this should all be fast. There's got to be some value. Yeah. Yeah. There is. Um, okay. So we've got to the end of the relationship structure. So we have time. Okay, so, and then there's ontology rules, which I haven't described before. So ontology rules basically is another concept here, as you can see the transitive location subclasses rule. And then there's an if and then. In the current version of the release, it's LHS, RHS, so left hand side, right hand side, but it also means if and then. Um, so if, th this is a Grackle query, so x, y, that's, that describes x is related to y in this tuple. X, Y is located in, so X is located in Y, Y is located in Z, therefore X is located in Z. So these are just variables, they're, they're placeholders. Um, and they're, like, they're not restricted to, for the users to, to, to have to write, um, to, to have the inference to only be applied when the user write the, um, their query using, using this, these, the, these variable names. And also this is a recursive role, which is actually problematic for you to resolve, but we've managed to work it. Um, so in this case, we see that if King's Cross is in London, London is in the UK, automatically when you query the next time, when you say, get me all of the located in relationship, the King's Cross will be considered to be in the UK immediately. So that's an example. Um, here's another rule, which is, like the previous one is more of an axiomatic rule. This is more of like a reusable rule that exists inside your business. So you know you work with a lot of schedules, and you know quite often you ask, find me overlapping schedule, which is basically, get A, get the end of it, and get B, get the start and end of it, and if A's end, 
is within like B um, start and end, then that means they overlap in one way in some way. And the order in which we write it doesn't matter, and the order in which the user writes it also doesn't matter. So next, so you said like so what how is it different with, with RDF and everything else in terms of the schema? So once you define the schema, so this is a a, 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 a a summary of everything that we just went through just now. So company um, is the employer in an employment relationship where employee is played by the person. But these two things are subclassed, company and to startup, person to customer. And the next time I actually, this is me inserting data. When I say X is a startup, has name Racket Labs, Y is a customer, name Bob, um, employee X, uh, employer X, employee Y is an employment. So Bob is actually also employed by Kraken Labs. So this, the, 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 in, the, the inheritance here, um, it, so we, we didn't clearly say that, that, the, that startups can, can be, uh, can be an, the startup can be an employer of a person, but because this is logically true, when you commit your right, uh, your right operation, it will pass through. But if you say something like, X is a person named Charlie, and Y is a company named Apple, X and Y is a marriage, the commit will fail, like on the spot, like as if you were writing like wrong statements into SQL. So that doesn't exist um, on any other knowledge graph. Like the real-time verification of your data coming in and verified based on a really, really complex model. And that is only possible because of the knowledge representation design that we found on how to be able to have local verification on everything that comes in right upon commit. So that's one of the first distinctions. Does it, does it, when it fails, does it fail you um, Right now, we're outputting the Java, like like the like stack trace, will we'll make it more descriptive. So it, yes, it's in the stack trace, but we can parse it to make it better, and read, read more readable. But it's still in the stack trace, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so we get to the query language. Why do we need to define, we build a new query language? Because a query language should not only be able to retrieve what is explicitly stored in the database, query language should also be able to retrieve implicitly derived information. So let's take a look. What do we mean by that? Before we get into Grackle, let's have a quick reminder of like what it look what queries look like in the SQL days. I mean it's still SQL days, I mean, like writing uh, uh, a relationship heavy query in SQL and Gremlin. So I'm not gonna try to read this SQL. It's, a, it's an example used by Datastacks, and it's trying to do um, a recommendation query. Get a customer A with ID ALFKI, and get a different customer B who has bought products that A have bought, and get other products from B that A have not bought, and order them by name. So we can see here it's a lot, lot shorter in Gremlin, but I'm still not going to read it. The thing is, we think that graph, like graph structures are natural to us. When we see it on a graph visualization toolkit, yes. But in a query, if you wrote the graph, sure. But if someone else wrote the graph, I don't find it natural to read this. First of all, I don't know the data model that they have that they structured their graph in. So given that graph query languages, you have to actually write the specific path in which you have to traverse to get the information. It, I'm not familiar with this path, so it'll take me a couple of minutes to make sense. So what does it look like in Grackle? This is what it looks like in Grackle. Not longer, only, uh, and only slightly shorter than Gremlin. But the query says, um, get match, eh, there's a match statement at the top here, which I missed. Match dollar A is a customer, ID LFIK. Get B is a customer, A is not the same as B. A bought product one, B bought product one, B bought product two, and product two is not the same as product one, Product two has the name N. Select product two, rank N. And I can write this in any order. I can write it with any variable. And once you're good at Grackle, you realize you can delete a lot of these things in the middle because when I say A product one, B product one, the system can infer that given that A is a customer, A must be playing the role of a buyer. I can shorten this even more. So that's what it looks like in Grackle. So slightly shorter than Gremlin, but it's a lot, lot more readable and this is one of the biggest value that I think for graph technologies to be able to be adopted 
um, across the world because we build technologies not to make it more difficult to use, right? We build technologies to make it hard to make it um, to make things more intelligent. But like the way you use the technology shouldn't be getting in the way. And you can't use graph technologies, you can't use graph query languages if you don't understand graph algorithms. And not everyone is good at graph algorithms by the time they graduate from university. And that was, like, that was really, really true because I was working in an optimization scheduling company where we had like 700 developers and I was in a team of, um, I probably shouldn't say this, but they, they, like, I was the one graph optimization um, uh, expert in the, in, in, in the team. And I still find a lot of people that doesn't understand the concept of v.in.out.e.v.in.out.e again. It's, it's hard. But if you can bring it down to just like more sentences, like, like statements in which you can understand, okay, cool. Um, hopefully graph technologies can be like, adopted a lot faster. Here's another example um, uh, where we show match dollar x is a person, y is a movie value, Titanic, z is a character, and this is a triple. x, y, z is a movie class. So we can query entity relationships just by doing triples, quadruples. And we see that this relationship here is actually attached to an attribute, has billing number B. Select X, Y, order them by B. And here's the example of us querying the marriage relationship where we assign the relationship to a variable. So M, X, Y is a marriage, therefore M represents that marriage. And then Z is a city as named Hawaii, M, Z is allocated in. So we're querying for every couple that got married in Hawaii. Now, this query that we looked at before, so this problem that we saw, um, I'm not going to try to write this in SQL and also not, or Grass, and I'm also, yeah, it, I can probably write an algorithm, of course, a function to be able to permutate across um, these types and generate the, the, the query, but we're not assessing algorithms to create database queries right now. We're actually assessing the actual database queries. So what does this look like in Grackle? Five lines. Because in these five lines, there are three inferences that happens. In this case, match dollar $x is a driver. This will infer all of, uh, every subtype of a driver. Y is a vehicle. It will infer every subtype of a vehicle. Z is a city named London. X, Y is a drive. Y, Z is a destination. And this will apply the transitive rule that we added to the ontology. So this will apply to every single place in London. So the reasoner takes, it takes care of actually resolving the permutation across all of these possible combinations of um, queries within the, in the actual data set to get you this information. So you never have to try to like, think harder on like, how your query should look like based on the data set. Your query should look like the way you think it, and you should be able to write it the way you say it. So that's Grackle reasoning, and briefly. So graph analytics query. So that was the connected component clustering algorithm that I showed earlier. So keep in mind that knowledge graphs are, is still a graph. So you can run graph analytics, uh, graph analytics com computation on top of it. Um, but the difference of knowledge graphs is that you have an ontology that describes the entire structure of what is inside your graph. That means now the machine actually understands what the, con what the relationship structure looks like. So now the ontology can become an input to our algorithm, and for the first time we found out, I found out over three, four years working on graph optimization, we can finally find generic Pregel BSP MapReduce algorithms for each of these generic um, network analytics, uh, for, e for each of these network analytics algorithms um, that, that is available out there, all of these like, textbook algorithms. And so the vertex, pro, uh, vertex class, the vertex program class for this connected component, it was a bit too long for me to screenshot. I didn't know how to do it because it's 261 lines. But you can go to the Tinkerpop um, uh, API. So just one class to implement this in the Tink Tinkerpop repository. Um, I think the, we looked at the, there's a page rank example there, and it's in the couple hundred lines. So now that we found a generic algorithm to actually represent this in a knowledge graph, you can do this in one line. And Grackle, and you can scope the subgraph in which you want to run the clustering algorithm on by saying the types in which you want it, you want the algorithm to apply to. So in this case, you want to find the clusters of all person and movie. So even though you have a lot more different things inside your graph, it will be ignored. It's not going to be traversed when the algorithm uh, runs. 
So right now, we define the subgraph by specifying the types in which you want to make available to the algorithm, which is already really, really powerful. But in the next couple of months, this will change, where you can actually write another graphical query to be as specific as you want to write the subgraph, and then call graph, the compute, a graph compute at the end, compute cluster at the end of it. And you run a clustering algorithm over on a highly specific subgraph in your data set. So other than computing clusters, we've implemented quite a lot. So all of the statistical uh, um, uh, graph analytics of so STD, mean, max, count, all of those um, clustering algorithms. And I think what's in the in the cooking right now, I think there's like centrality, page rank. Um, there's compute path, which I didn't. It's compute path, finding shortest path between things as well. I may have missed out a few things in here, but you get the idea. So there's. We basically create graph analytics as a language as well, as part of the knowledge, as part of the knowledge graph. So everything that you saw before this page is OLTP, and everything that you see on this page is OLAP. So it still takes the same amount of time to run an OLAP algorithm, but the difference is for you to be able to experiment anything, it takes one line of code for you to write it instead of thinking how you actually implement this particular algorithm. And that's, uh, that's how we think we would be able to help you work with complex data sets and hopefully making it a lot easier for you to model it, to add your business rules into it, you don't have to take care of it, to be able to query it and you don't have to have a hard time trying to interpret it, and to be able to analyze it with just like one code without trying to think of how to implement it. And that's graphical AI. Right. Thank you. Yeah.